to watch me talk to some random people. Yeah, I swear. But anyway, I'm Keith, and I'm one of the original eight kids that started Food Out Bombs. And uh, at the time, I was a painting uh, student at Boston University. And one of the, I, like any art student, you also had to take academics. And one of my Amer my American history teacher was Howard Zinn. Oh. And he wrote a book called uh, People's History of the United States. And he would talk about how he was going up to Seabrook, New Hampshire to protest the uh, uh, nuclear power station that was being built in a group. I mean, no nuclear power stations would be built at all, but it was a particularly stupid location for one, even from a nuclear scientist's point of view. And so we were going up there to protest it, and on uh, May 24th, uh, the May 24th occupation attempt of Seabrook Nuclear Power Station, one of my friends, Brian, was arrested, and he was a, a fellow student at the law school at BU. And so we decided we had to start raising money for his legal defense. And so the first thing we did was the bake sales. And so we'd be out there with our baked goods. And after, you know, you, a whole afternoon and a whole night of baking stuff, we'd get five or six dollars, seven dollars. And we're like, this is a really slow way to raise money for a legal defense. <laughs> and so, but like any college students, we had a bunch of ways of making a living. And another way was we had an old van and a moving company called Smooth Move. So we were driving around the city, like with helping people move their furniture. And this one family um, was an uh, activist family, that was most of our clients. And they were uh, throwing out this poster that said, Wouldn't it be a beautiful day if the schools had all the money they needed and the Air Force had to hold a bake sale to buy a bomber? So it was like, actually a big poster um, that was being tossed out. It's in the back of my book. And so we thought, Wow, that's a great idea. Why don't we dress up like generals and we'll go out on the streets with our big goods and put the poster up against our, our, our table and tell people we're trying to buy a bomber. And the people are like, oh, you kind of don't really look like generals, you look sort of like hippies and military people. We said, no, 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 we're really trying to buy a bomber. And eventually we would uh, convince them to hang out and talk to us about Brian's case and stuff like that. And it was so much more fun. We didn't make any more money, really, but we had a lot more fun. And then my other job at that time was working as a produce worker at the, one of the first commercial uh, natural food stores called Bread and Circus. And so I was trimming produce every day, and I was tossing out all this great produce at the, at the end of my shift in the morning, and I thought, we should like start taking this to people that needed it. And so my boss was cool with that, and a couple blocks away on Portland Street, there was these housing projects. So I started taking the food over there. And I asked the people at the projects, what's this brand new glass building across the street from you? What are they doing in there? And they said, oh, they're just designing stuff for nuclear weapons. And so I found out that they were designing the guidance system for intercontinental nuclear uh, missiles, which became sort of GPS. And so um, we thought, wow, that's really strange. You got people starving on one side of the street, and just like 100 yards away, people making $100,000 a year designing this high-tech way to shoot a missile from the U.S. to the Soviet Union. So that's where we came up with the idea of the name Food Not Bombs. And so then um, some friends of mine came and said, well, you know, we found out that the Bank of Boston, that their board of directors are the same board of directors as the Public Service Company of New Hampshire that's building Seabrook Nuclear Power Station. And they're the same as the board of directors of Babcock and Wilcox, which is building the nuke. And they're on the board of Raytheon Missile Systems and Lockheed. And they're basically lending themselves money without uh, oversight. And so we thought, wow, we have all this produce and, and stuff. Why don't we make a bunch of soup? And we'll dress up as hobos. And we'll make a brochure showing how the board of directors are all connected and how that was similar to the, what caused the Great Depression. And then we'll go out there and say, look at the policies of the Bank of Boston could lead to a time in the future where people might have to stand in line to eat at soup kitchens. And so uh, we were making this huge amount of soup, and we're like, wow, I wonder if it's only eight of us, and, and there's, you know, it won't look like a soup line, and it's a shame to have such great food and nobody to eat it. So in the middle of the night, we got the idea to go to the Pine Street Inn and give a speech about why we're having this protest. 
And the guys at the Pine Street Inn were like, oh, that's so cool, a protest like the 60s, way to go. And uh, in those days, it's hard to believe, but there was not a lot of people living on the streets. So we were kind of shocked. We found the Pine Street Inn, and we found these guys that were interested in what we were doing. So the next day, outside the Federal Reserve Bank of, of Boston, where the stockholders meeting at the First National Bank of Boston was, was being held, we arrived just before noon, set up a soup kitchen, we had all our like hobo costumes and everything, and all these dudes from the Pine Street Inn showed up. And before long, we had about 70, 80 people hanging out in front of the Federal Reserve Bank, all talking about the policies of the bank, and, and like people giving suggestions, oh yeah, we could do that or this, or you know, they should jail these bakers, things like that. It was pretty amazing. And sometimes the stockholders would come up and eat with us, and other times they'd give us the middle finger on the way back into the meeting, and business guys were hanging out with us and talking to the homeless guys, because the uh, South Station was right there, and a lot of guys would come up out of the subway on the way to the, one of the investment banks there. And It was this amazing day. That was uh, March 26, 1981. And so, at the end of that, while we're washing all the pots and pans and everything, we thought, we just quit our jobs and do nothing but take food to people that need it and collect food that can't be sold and do street theater every evening. So I went to my boss at Bread and Circus and gave two weeks notice. And he was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you can keep taking the food. And we set up a route in the Smooth Move van where we drive all around the Boston area. And we had all these regular pickups at Air One and the food co-ops and Bread and Circus and Haymarket, uh, Warburton's Bakery and all these bagel places. And then the middle of the day, we had these community centers that knew we were coming at the housing projects. And we'd bring them groceries for free, or we'd go to Rosie's Place and the Pine Street Inn and uh, all these different uh, places that needed free food. And then in the late afternoon, we would go out to Harvard Square or the Boston Commons and we'd set up a literature table and we'd, do, uh, we'd have uh, friends with drums come and we eventually had, we had two friends that had whole complete drum sets that would, would be like drumming to get a crowd together and then we started making little Super 8 movies out of uh, from these cameras we got at thrift stores for five bucks and we would act in them and then project the, them onto the uh, sheets behind us and it was like this whole theater every evening it was just uh, so much fun and then one day we're out there doing this and uh, a group comes uh, named the Pepsi Challenge and they set up a, a tent next to us with their sign saying the Pepsi Challenge and uh, we uh, heard about this idea. What they were doing was they were opening bottles of Coke. They hired college students to open uh, bottles of Coke at night. And then you would come out, be blindfolded, and you would taste the Coke and the Pepsi. And you have to guess which was Coke and which was Pepsi. And apparently it was very well advertised because a lot of people knew about this. So we happened to uh, just move to uh, the New England Free Press, and they gave us all their overstock. And one of their brochures was about how Coca-Cola was hiring death squads to kill labor organizers in uh, Guatemala. And it turned out a, a dentist who was retiring thought we could use all of his little tiny cups and they were the same size and color as the cups that the Pepsi Challenge was using. So we also had a really great tofu hookup and so uh, we started blending fruit and tofu together and making smoothies. And we made our sign that looked just like the Pepsi Challenge sign, but ours said, take the tofu fruit smoothie challenge. And so the people would line up in front of us and we'd go, take the smoothie challenge. We have more nutrition than this one cup of tofu fruit smoothie than all the Pepsi products on earth. And here's the brochure about Coca-Cola killing labor organizers in Guatemala, and the people are like, whoa, that wasn't on the ad that we saw. And, uh, they would be like, and this huge line going by, doing the tofu smoothie challenge on their way to the Pepsi challenge. And eventually they called the police on us, of course, and the cops come and say, well, I don't think you're going to have any luck getting rid of these people. Um, they're friends with uh, Cambridge City Council. We would already organized three marches from City Hall to this weapons lab over on Portland by the projects we had first started taking food to. And we had a refrigerator in City Hall and all this stuff. So um, eventually after a few weeks, unfortunately, the Pepsi Challenge, people moved to another corner. And there just wasn't enough room for us two at that corner. So we moved on to other street performances. And um, that's basically what we did for... Uh, 
eight years in, in Boston. We took food to New York City and Washington DC to big protest. We even floated a bunch of food on the Rainbow Warrior, the first uh, Greenpeace ship before it was bombed by New Zealand, I think, or France in New Zealand. Um, and so we had like a lot of fun just being our little crew in Boston for the first eight years. And then in 88 I moved to San Francisco and we got a grant from American Peace Test to, uh, to take food for 10 days out to a protest uh, at the Nevada test site. And so we started, we um, bought tables and we got big pots for San Francisco Food Not Bombs and we got a big tub of miso um, that we bought from uh, JFC, Japanese Food Corporation. And they were surprised the white dude was buying so much miso. But <laughs> I tried to explain what I was doing. And um, we go out there to the desert and uh, we're sharing food at the main gate like every, you know, three times a day. And uh, these kids come up and go, oh wow, we um, heard about a Food Not Bombs and we're sharing food in Long Beach, California, but we thought the name Food Not Bombs was copywritten, so we're calling ourselves Bread Not Bombs. We're like, oh no, call yourself Food Not Bombs, and then there'll be three groups, one in Boston, one in Long Beach, <laughs> and one in San Francisco, and they're like, oh cool, we'll do that. <laughs> and so now suddenly we have three Food Not Bombs chapters, and we're all excited. We go back to San Francisco, and um, we figure out that there's um, no meals in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood on Mondays, but all the other days are covered. And there's a lot of people living in Golden Gate Park. The entrance to the park is a lot like where we're sharing food in the commons and, at par and, uh, and Harvard Square. So we decide that we set up every Monday at noon at the entrance to Golden Gate Park at Hayden Stanion. And it's going really good. We've got our music and everything is the way it was sort of in Boston. And this hippie comes by and he says, oh, you can get a permit to do this. Just write a letter to the Parks Department. We're like, oh, that sounds so nice. So we write them a letter. And then every once in a while we'll go by their office and then, well, we really don't know what you're talking about. We never heard of a permit for something like this. We're like, okay, well, whatever. If you get one, mail it to us. We're happy. <laughs> and so, um, so we go out on August 15th, Monday, August 15th, and we got everything <coughs> set up. And uh, lo and behold, 45 riot police come out of Golden Gate Park and arrest nine of us for sharing food without this permit that no one knows about. <laughs> and so it turned out the police were really wise. They told the San Francisco Chronicle they were going to do this, so they sent a photographer and a recorder. So the next day, there's a big photo of riot police guarding the food from the hungry with, with our sign saying food not bombs. And there's an article, nine volunteers arrested feeding homeless at Golden Gate Park. And so people would say, wow, how can we get arrested with you guys? This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> so we end up organizing a uh, say, so, well, why don't we meet at one end of Haight Street, and we told people, bring your pots and spoons to be, as instruments. And uh, by now, we started taking notes of how we would start this group, because the Boston one had just sort of evolved over years. So this time, we thought, wow, well, maybe somebody else wants to do this. So we started taking notes on how to do it. And so the next Monday, about 150 people show to uh, Buena Vista Park and we marched down the street carrying the food and our literature and everything. One guy had made a painting of Dr. Spock um, from Star Trek, I guess, right? So we're all marching, he's leading us down the street and we get to the end and we set up and uh, this time they make uh, 29 arrests. And the, um, there was a new TV company called Cable Network News and they showed up and they broadcast this all over the world that the 29 volunteers arrested and the New York Times and the Times of India and, and the Times of London, all these uh, outlets all over the world have an article that 29 people are arrested feeding the homeless in San Francisco. So people start to call us and write letters from all over the world going, how do we start a group like this? We want to get arrested in our town. <laughs> so we take the little notes that we've been making we made it into a flyer called Seven Steps to Starting of Food Not Bombs, which there's a kind of more modernized version of it here because the internet was invented since then. But um, <laughs> so we start sending that to people. And then the next week, uh, about 500 people show up. 
and we march down Hay Street again. We have our guy with his painting of Dr. Spock, and we get to the end, and we start to, we start to serve the food, and the and the police go, we don't mind that they're feeding the homeless. It's that they're making a political statement, and that's not allowed. So we're going to give them city buses, take the homeless out to the army at the ocean. You can feed them inside there, but you can't be out here with flyers and banners and music and stuff like that in public. That's just that crazy. What are you thinking? And so he said, well, what we're thinking is that there's 50 cents of every federal tax dollar is going to the military, so why don't we clearly have enough resources so no one has to live in Golden Gate Park unless they really want to, and that no one has to eat at the soup kitchens, that everybody could have their own place to, to uh, cook and to eat. And so the next week is Labor Day weekend. And uh, about 2,000 people come out to get arrested. And after they make 54 arrests, the police kind of just wander off because they don't really know what to do. There's no there, there, or anything like that. And so uh, the next day, the mayor calls us frantically wanting to have a meeting. So we have a meeting with him, uh, Mayor Art Agnos, and he gives us a permit so he can stop arresting us. <laughs> so now we have so much interest, we decide to serve uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays in San Francisco, and a group started in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, New York City, Washington, D.C. Um, so there was like, now starting to be a number of, like, Arcata started at that time, Whittier, California, of all places for some reason. So there was like, like kind of a little bit of movement. Then the next summer, we're doing our three meals a week, and people come to us and they say, look, the cops are saying we can't be homeless in San Francisco, we have to rent an apartment or leave town, we can't do that, we don't have money, we are from here, and we've seen what those students are doing over in China at Tenement Square, so we're going to start camping out in front of the city hall at Tenement Square. So we go, okay, that sounds good, and, said, and then on the third day they said, can you come over and help us out? Um, we really need some people to bring us food so we don't have to leave the camp and go, go pl eat places. So we have a meeting after the Wednesday meal and we decided we'd set up a 24 hour a day vegetarian restaurant in front of City Hall. <laughs> and so we set up with everybody there, we start having these meetings every night. Uh, where we used consensus to make decisions, we got porta potties, we kept the place clean. Every day at noon, when the mayor and the politicians came out of City Hall, we would have a homeless ballet or homeless <laughs> concerts and homeless poetry readings, and this went on and on and on. And then eventually, on the 27th day, the mayor said, Well, we've got a solution for the homeless. Everyone can go down to the abandoned Jaguar dealership on Polk Street and move in there. And if you're a good homeless person, you'll live at the shelter. And if we catch you outside, you're a criminal. So we have to help about 200 riot police. We pack all our stuff up and go down to the new shelter. And it turns out that you have to leave your wife and children in the streets. It was only for men. You have to get, take your uh, pets to the pound. No animals allowed. Um, there would be no um, mattresses, so you had to bring your own cardboard box to sleep on, uh, and there would be no food. So we're like, wow, that doesn't really sound like a solution to homelessness to us. So we go back to City Hall and we serve lunch. And this time the police arrest 16 of us and take all of our food. So we go, that's really discouraging. So we have another meeting and we thought, why don't we divide the food into thirds? So at dinner, we had a couple of people come out with just a little bit of food and a little cardboard food not bomb sign. And the cops would arrest them and take that food. Yeah. Then we'd come with a little bit more food and another little cardboard <laughs> sign. The cops arrest them, take that food. And then while the captain of the Northern States was going, that's great, you stopped food not bombs. Way to go, man. Way to go. <laughs> we'd come out with all the rest of the food and feed everybody that show. And so we do this twice a day. And after a while, we're like, wow, we're going to burn out getting arrested every day like this. We didn't have a plan. So we thought, why don't we do this? We'll have risk arrest one day a month with food out bombs. And then your group can get arrested with us. So the first people to join us were a group of nuns and priests. So they arrest the nuns, the priests, and they, they pat down the nuns. And they, you know, nuns with guns is really dangerous. And so and then they, they arrest the, uh, the carpenters' union, and they arrest the peace, several peace groups, and they arrest uh, um, like a teachers' union. And then this group comes out, and they have a big banner, and it says, National Lawyers Guild. Yeah. And the cops look at that banner and they scratch their heads. And what are we going to do now? <laughs> so instead of arresting the lawyers, 
they just arrested a few of the people that came to eat. <laughs> and this goes on every day and twice a day. About 300 arrests up by October. And then on October 17th, there was this huge earthquake while we were preparing the meal. We need to be down there at 6. The earthquake goes at 5.05. The gas and electricity goes off. So we're like, okay, well, let's just go down there with, and take the stoves and equipment from the 10 city protest, the Ten Tenement Square protest, and cook. And the cops will probably be busy doing something about this earthquake. So we get down there, and now we've got more food than ever, because every grocery store is calling us for food. More people than ever have showed up. So we're making even more food than ever before. And then more police vehicles than ever start to show up. And we're astounded. They're all marching across towards us. And we're like, wow, it's like an hour after this earthquake, and they're sending all the cops to us. <laughs> but they, instead of arresting us, they stood in line patiently with everybody else, and they had dinner. And then they showed up the next day for breakfast, and, and the police ate with us for the next three days because we were the only food in town for anybody to get a meal at. So, that was that. So, those arrests inspire people to start chapters in most of the cities of major cities of Canada. So, Quebec, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, uh, Victoria. And groups started in uh, England, in Brixton, England, and uh, in London, in the Brixton neighborhood, uh, uh, Prague, Czechoslovakia, Melbourne, Australia, and all over the United States. Now there was like tons of food not bombs chapters, and the um, Melbourne chapter and the uh, um, and the Prague chapter they even made a benefit album where half the bands were from were singing in Czech and the other half in English, and half were from. Uh, the uh, Czechoslovakia and the other half were from Australia. So then things like moving right along and uh, we find out that the Congress has voted to have San Francisco be the official city to celebrate the uh, 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering the New World. And so Native people held a meeting in Arctic Circle, Alaska and they said, well, maybe this 500 years is enough so we're going to have a protest. And around that, uh, we had been asked uh, by a publisher in Philadelphia to write a book called Food Not Bombs, How to Feed the Hungry and Build Community, uh, based on their having seen our flyer, Seven Steps. And so that was going to come out in October of 92 as well. So we decided to have our first Food Not Bombs gathering in San Francisco. We'd meet for two days, and then we would feed the big protest uh, against the Columbus celebration. So about 70 people show up to the gathering. We meet at this place called Cauliflower Collective in the Mission Street. And we um, decide we should come up with the principles of Food Not Bombs because so far we just are kind of doing it. Now we have all these chapters. Maybe we should have some agreement. So we um, decided that there would be three principles. That first, that the food would always be uh, vegan or vegetarian and free to anyone without restriction, rich or poor, drunk or sober. That, the, uh, that there be no headquarters or presidents or directors, that each chapter would be autonomous and make decisions using the process, the uh, consensus process, and then we try to invite the people eating with us to participate in the, in the decision making and the operation of, of each local chapter. And that we wouldn't be a charity, but that we would be a direct act, that we'd be dedicated to nonviolent direct action to change society so no one would have to stand in line to get food at a soup kitchen or live in the streets. And so after we uh, made these agreements, we decided we made a huge amount of food. Uh, the first action we went down to was in the morning at Aquatic Park. To, um, that's where Columbus was scheduled to land. But this time, the uh, Native American community just pushed them back out in the San Francisco Bay. <laughs> Some of the Food Not Bombs kids went to the Columbus Avenue Parade, and they stole the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria off the floats. <laughs> and were chased through the city by the Italian American Association. And then we had a big party, and people got books, and they went back to their homes to do even, organize even more Food Not Bombs chapters in community, communities near where they lived. So then the chief of police announced he was going to run for mayor on the anti-homeless uh, platform. He said if he got elected, he'd round up all the homeless people in the city, he'd put them in a work camp south of San Francisco, he'd even put a little sign over the entrance saying, work shall make you free. And of course he got elected, and he started this campaign called Quality of Life Enforcement Matrix Program. And uh, he was uh, able to get some 
airplanes with thermal imaging devices uh, donated by the Justice Department so they could fly up and down the parks and the streets and see the body heat from the people living outside and nowhere to round them up. And we go get a video camera from American Civil Liberties Union and sh thinking, well, they'll probably come to the Food Not Bombs meal any day now. And sure enough, they did. And when the police came, they ordered all the people to take their shoes off and throw them in the garbage trucks. They came with uh, mental health workers, declared people mentally ill, took them away, arrested people on warrants. They had the animal control to take people's pets. They, we filmed them also taking people's blankets and sleeping bags and all their personal belongings to discard. And uh, we got video of a grandmother who was struggling to save her photo album of her grandchildren from the police who eventually just cried out of her arms and were able to throw it away. So we give those videos to all the TV companies in the, in the Bay Area. And uh, the only ones that showed it were Channel 2 in Oakland. The mayor was furious. It made his uh, Matrix program look inhumane. So he called up the uh, city attorney's office and he got a, uh, uh, a court order against us serving food without a permit. And he went to the parks department and he had uh, the previous mayor's permit process deleted. So now we start getting arrested for felony conspiracy to serve food in violation of a court order. So we go back to dividing the food into thirds. We call up the nuns again, and they come out without their guns and start sharing the food with us. And the lawyer's guild comes out and doesn't get arrested, and it becomes this huge thing. And the police are getting more frustrated. The mayor is more frustrated. So they have a special squad who now starts to, to beat us up when we're sharing food. And we're taking video of this every time we serve, so we ended up with this video we called Food Not Bombs Greatest Hits, and uh, we, had, we ended up getting all this like, documentation from the police and stuff, and Howard Zinn happens to come to speak on our behalf again, and he suggests we uh, write letters to Clinton administration to get them to send in the federal marshals like they did on the freedom marches in and, and the south. But uh, Clinton just writes us a letter saying, no, uh, we can't see anything illegal about these beatings and the wiretap memos and all the stuff that we gave them. And so we give that letter to end all the other documentation to Amnesty International, the UN Human Rights Commission, all these people to try to build support. And uh, it turns out the Coalition on Homelessness in, in uh, D.C. calls for a big national housing now protest on Thanksgiving. And we find out that all these people that are eating with us have lived in this hotel across the street from Glide Memorial Church, the big soup kitchen in San Francisco. And they've been evicted because uh, it turned out the mayor's friend wanted to, instead of it being a $20 a night hotel, make it a $300 a night hotel. And so we decided that we would sneak in that hotel the night before Thanksgiving, knowing that the mayor would come to Glide to cut turkey to have his photo op. So while we're in there all night with our banners, and then the mayor shows up, and we start hanging banners out the window, and one of them says, Homes, not jails. So this gave us the idea, because of uh, all these foreclosed houses during the savings loan crisis, that we could go around the city and find out who owned these empty houses. We'd go to City Hall with the addresses. If it was banks suing each other, then we would uh, go and put our own locks on those buildings. And then, at night, we'd make an announcement to everybody that came for dinner. He said, anybody here want a free house, any free place to live? And you would be surprised how many homeless people want a free house. And he's like, so No, particularly with the rain like it is today, they were like, wow, well, yeah, we'll take a free house. So we said, well, meet us tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning at this address, and we'll give you a free place to live. So the people would show up. We'd have the key to the door, so we'd open it up. We would help them turn on the electricity and the water. We'd fix up the building. We'd give them a lease. The neighbors would go, oh, that's so nice. They're finally fixing up that old place down the street. <laughs> and, and according to the book, uh, No Trespassing, we had keys to 400 buildings. And we had people living in at least two, uh, 100 of them at any given time, sometimes as many as 200 of those houses. So, not long after that, we were going to read all the names of the people that died in the streets of San Francisco living outside, um, mostly from hypothermia. And so we called the media, and the media says, oh, we can't take phone calls from you people. The police have been here and said that that would be aiding and abetting and a felony. So we had a friend, Stephen Dunnerford, over in Berkeley that was an um, electrical engineer, and he talked about making uh, FM radio transmitters. So we decided to make free radio Berkeley and San Francisco Yay, Liberation yeah. Radio. 
So we um, would be up in the hills. We were we had this little van that a uh, uh, camper, Toyota camper, we were using for a studio, and we're up on Twin Peaks. Could you read our little communique on your radio station for us about why we're having an uprising in southern Mexico against the North American Free Trade Agreement? And we're like, oh, that sounds so nice. We would like to do that. And so we're up on top of Twin Peaks reading the communique from the Zapatistas, and we start noticing that there's a lot of police behind us. So I pull an antenna real fast. We um, put the, the, the mixer and the mics underneath the table. We get off some crackers and hummus. The cops look in. We go, oh, Happy New Year's. We're just celebrating. No problem here. And they're like, oh, okay. And then they leave. And then we get the antenna back out. And we keep reading about the Zapatistas. And, and then the next day in front of City Hall, we have this big sign saying, Viva Zapatista, no NAFTA. And people are really supporting us, except for this one guy comes out of City Hall and starts screaming at us that we have to leave, we can't share food anymore. After all, this is 1994, maybe you could do it in 93, but not in 94. And, and so he had a cell phone, which was a new thing at the time, and he called up a tow truck, and they came and they just took our truck away. And I was like, wow, that's really crazy. So I go to City Hall and, uh, to make a phone call to find out how we get the truck back. And the dude comes into this phone booth and starts smashing me against the wall. And it's like, oh, I'm sorry, tow lady, there's a man smashing me against the wall. I will have to call you from another phone. <laughs> and so I go upstairs and finish finding out how to get our vehicle back. And there's these nice men at the bottom steps of, of the rotunda in, in City Hall. And they go, oh, Keith, we want to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? And they go, oh, you're under arrest for assault battery and strong arm robbery. And that's a strike under the new California Three Strikes Law. So they take me away, and I'm like, wow, that's really hardcore. And, and uh, <laughs> it takes a while to get out of jail. But now we're getting uh, responses from Amnesty and the UN and so on. And so we get a letter from Amnesty International saying we'll be declared prisoners of conscience if we're convicted. And we're like really psyched about that. So we're going through City Hall before the supervisors meeting, visiting their offices. And this one supervisor has hated homeless people, hated us. She slams her uh, door really hard on me and my friend Jesse, and the glass breaks out and cuts my hand. So I um, go to my truck where I get arrested again. And they uh, book me, and they'd say, what, they book me on uh, my second strike and my third strike. So they said I was trying to kill the woman with the glass, and the witness who was in San Diego, I'd seen everything. And I had apparently stolen 24 Berkeley Farms dairy milk crates, which we were using every day as a table, because the cops took our tables every day, and we'd borrow them from this uh, vegetarian restaurant near City Hall, and the, the police didn't take our milk crates, we just took them back. So I was now facing 25 to life in prison. And uh, first, my bail was like quarter million dollars, and it took a while to get the bail down to 75,000. And then eventually, I got to go to trial, which turned out to be the opening day of my trial was the same as the opening day of the first O.J. Simpson trial. So that's probably why you didn't hear about it. And, uh, so, um, I, I, they have me in a bulletproof plexiglass box for the safety of the community, and they have five police ringing the inside of the courtroom. And the judge is like, oh, there's too much chaos here. We can't have a trial today. So they ask the clerk for another date. And the clerk says, well, it's open on uh, October 31st. So we go back down, and this time there's little bowls of trick or treat candy in all the judges' chambers and on the desks and, and offices throughout the courthouse. So people help themselves to the trick or treat candy, they go to the front of the courthouse, they get arrested giving out the candy. Then the judge says, Oh, it's too much chaos, let's choose another day. And the clerk says, well, February 14th is available. <laughs> so we come back down, yeah, and now there's Valentine's candy in all these bowls. So we take that to the front of the courthouse, hand it out, and get arrested. And the judge is freaking out. Oh my god, we can't have a trial today. So they figured out they could send, uh, send me to this uh, another judge the next morning, Judge Lucy McKay. As it turned out, she was already drunk at 9 o'clock, as uh, we anticipated. And um, so she's like, oh, why are they bothering a good Irish boy like you? That <laughs> <laughs> she's like, what we'll do is we'll, we'll give you credit for time served, 500 days. 
Um, we'll drop all 47 felony conspiracy to serve food charges. Um, and we'll drop your three strike charges. Just make up some crime you want to be um, convicted of so we can tell the mayor you're a convicted felon and you can write your own probation. So I write my own probation. I'm not allowed to uh, murder anybody or bomb any buildings for 12 months. <laughs> and, uh, then it was rough. And, uh, so then I'm like, uh, I start going on these tours, <laughs> stay out of town. And um, one of the, I did the rent a theft tour where I made tofu spread. I did the tofu spread demonstration and. Uh, talk of the, about food not bombs. I broadcast it on a little uh, FM transmitter to radios placed around the room, things like that. And, um, and then we find out that they're going to celebrate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at UM Plaza, which is now where we've moved our meals to because the Board of Supervisors had voted twice to give us a permit there and that was the only little piece of land they had the right to issue permits for, but the police didn't care that we had permits. They arrested us and beat us every day there. So, um, so we decided to have another Funa Bombs gathering, and we rented a convergence space near UN Plaza. We made our own like gathering FM radio station. We had a newsletter. Um, we had workshops on composting, organic gardening, how to uh, prepare large meals, make giant puppets, giant banners, how to run cars on vegetable oil. It was this amazing. Uh, workshops, and we were arrested twice a day sharing food to ourselves at UN Plaza, and um, there was over 600 arrests during the 10-day gathering. We'd been donated a bunch of little uh, computers, and we figured out how to make websites, and we started this thing called Indie Media, and started uploading news every day about the, the gathering, and we had workshops on all these things. And people, uh, there was over 600 arrests during this. The largest felony arson arrest in U.S. history was during this, during a uh, protest against the death penalty, where we had uh, torches and marched to the city before Mumia Abu Jamal was supposed to be executed. And people were so psyched being jailed together and going to these workshops together and all this stuff that when they left, they started even more Food Not Bombs chapters. And uh, shortly after that, I was invited to, uh, to Europe because the first book that I wrote was uh, translated into Spanish. So I traveled through uh, Europe, and everybody was trying to stop the Maastricht Treaty, the single European currency. And they had this video they made called 50 Years is Enough, and they're explaining that the euro would be devastating to Europe and a single currency in a eurozone was, had to stop it. It was all like a plot by the World Bank and these people. And so at that time, that seemed pretty out crazy, but you know, we're like, okay, we'll look into that. And we decided to do another tour of the U.S. against the World Trade Organization um, in 97 called the Unfree Trade Tour. And we traveled all around the U.S. and Canada advocating if the WTO ever comes to North America, we should try to shut them down and blockade it. And so a uh, year after that tour, they announced that the WTO would meet in Seattle. So everybody just signed up on our sign-up sheet. We called them and, and tried to get them to come to Seattle. We rented another convergence space. Um, we organized this thing called DAN with a bunch of our friends called Direct Action Network and organized nonviolent training so we could or try to blockade the summit. Um, that we, by now, Indie Media, there's a, some kids down in Australia figured out how to do self-publishing software. So now Indie Media centers were all over the country and all over the world. And that was an amazing protest in uh, 99 in Seattle against the WTO. And then, um, after that, I get an email from this journalist in Australia. And she says, well, I've been uh, making a documentary about these Aboriginal people that are trying to stop a gold mine on sacred land. He said that this group, Food Not Bombs, had been feeding them and this other group, Earth First, who were trying to stop the, the gold mine, and they prepared meals at a base camp for two years, and she wanted to know if I knew anything about Food Not Bombs. I said, yeah, I'd heard of them. I'd be happy to help her out. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm going to fly over and interview you. And I said, well, that's a little crazy just to fly from Australia to interview me, so why don't we visit Food Not Bombs chapters all around the country? So we drive all over the U.S. and Canada interviewing people eating with Food Not Bombs and we tried to film some generals at the, um, testifying at a um, you know, weapons procurement hearing at the Congress and all these things. It was really amazing. 
And during that time, she won an award and had to go to Spain to get an award for Best Environmental Documentary. And the Food Not Bombs book got translated into Italian by this punk man called Kafka out of Genoa. So they wanted me to come over. So we decided to continue the tour. The first city we went to was Zagreb, Croatia. And it turned out the kids there had, in Food Not Bombs had served over a thousand meals outside the U.S. Embassy. And they were like, why are you visiting just Zagreb, Food Not Bombs? We have six chapters in Croatia. I'm like, I didn't even know there's six cities in Croatia. <laughs> well, it's like Food Not Bombs chapters. And I go, oh, yeah. So everybody comes together. and We do this huge meal. The next day turns out to be anti-McDonald's Day, October 16th. So we do a meal outside the McDonald's. They had ordered these uh, black balloons with golden arches that said, eat shit in Croatian, to give all the kids coming there. So we hit those out. And then the rights group came with a silver platter with a severed head of a cow to give to all the patrons coming in. It was like really hardcore. And then they were saying, well, you should meet the kids over in Serbia. They actually did food not bombs while being bombed. I'm like, wow, that's a trip. So we went over to Belgrade. And so we're cooking in Rebel Squat, which is this abandoned mansion in downtown Belgrade. And I'm like, i got to really go to the bathroom. Where's the bathroom in this place? And they say, oh, you know that hole over on the other side where the cruise missile went through the roof? We just go in there. Because it just like didn't blow up, and it went right through the basement. So that was their restroom. And then we went to the McDonald's and handed out food and again. And this time the cops came and said, this is a great idea. We really like this. They turned us on to the kids in Romania. <laughs> then we went over to uh, uh, the Netherlands and the food out there are 12 chapters there and they had just returned from a bus tour visiting food out bombs in Poland. And they'd made this cool documentary about it. They donated supplies to the Polish food out bombs kids. Then we went to, uh, you know, we tr started traveling all over Europe. We went to uh, Ireland and we provided food. All the chapters on Ireland got together at Shannon Air Base and fed the uh, protest. We were trying to blockade the U.S. troops flying there on their way to Iraq and Afghanistan. The Belfast kids took us to their meal. The turnout they served right on the, uh, half the kids were of uh, Protestant background, half were of Catholic background, and they served right on the border every Sunday at noon between the two communities. And uh, they also did a thing called Tools for Peace, where they get collected hand tools and pedal sewing machines, which they boxed up and shipped to uh, groups in Africa so they could build uh, schools and hospitals and things like that and tech, you know, do sewing industry. We went to Copenhagen. They just won the Danish Peace Award at that time. Uh, we went to, uh, um, we did go to Poland. In Poland, there were 12 chapters. Uh, or 12 cities had food not bombs. Warsaw itself had 12 chapters. Every chapter had their own, uh, they still put their own aprons and chef's hats with the logo. They had made their own videos. When you do, do food not bombs YouTube, you'll see all these Polish food not bombs videos which are almost exactly the same, they're just always a different town. <laughs> oh, you collect the food, cook the food, share the food, <laughs> have the party. Um, and then uh, they, and it turned out they started when this young man had gotten a, uh, an article from uh, Red Profane Existence. He was on their mailing list somehow, and he read an article about Food Not Bombs being arrested in Minneapolis. And from those six paragraphs, he figured out how to start Food Not Bombs in Poland. And that was before Poland had... Uh, switched over to being totally capitalist and stuff. So they were like involved doing Food Not Bombs really early on. His name was Kristoff. And then it went to, uh, um, to Slovakia. And after the Czechoslovakia divided, the 20 chapters on the Slovakia side of the border decided that there was never a tradition of, of helping animals. And there were all these stray animals around. So that each chapter not only shared free food every week, sometimes every day, they also started animal rescue shelters in each of their towns. So when I got there, my presentation was broadcast on national TV and national radio because Food Not Bombs was such a huge deal in Slovakia. And then we went to Istanbul. It turned out George Bush was going to come to speak at a NATO meeting. So we decided to do a, an action called uh, Food Not NATO in uh, Tuscan Square outside the first McDonald's in the Muslim world. And uh, the first guy in line, he turned to everybody and said, this food is fantastic, it's really great. And it turned out he was the, the, the uh, manager of the McDonald's. And so he had all of his employees come out with trays of ice cream and Coke to give to everybody that had come. And uh, he didn't get the vegan part, but he got the free part. He didn't know that part. <laughs> and then uh, after that, we went over to uh, Tel Aviv. And it turned out Food Not Bombs in, in Tel Aviv had started when a group of young people refused to fight in the Israeli Defense Forces. And so they decided to organize a refusenit conf conference. 
and they figured they needed food at that, so they started food on bombs to feed their own conference. So after that, they were uh, connected with these Palestinian activists on the West Bank, and they were asked to provide meals for two months at a peace camp. So they, at that peace camp, they came to the decision they would start a group called Anarchists Against the Wall. So as we were flying from Istanbul to Tel Aviv, it turned out they did their first Anarchist Against the Wall action. So no one met us at the airplane, but eventually we found them in Jaffa and they were editing this video of themselves being shot at by the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. And one of the Funat Bombs girls, she was like, oh, I should have stayed there longer. Those bullets weren't f shooting that fast, you know? <laughs> they just cut like more fence. And uh, it was really amazing. One of the Funat Bombs kids, Gil, was injured actually and, and almost perished, uh, but did, did survive. Then the next day we did a, uh, made all this food, went to the outside the Knesset and fed a protest trying, uh, organized by Greenpeace trying to get genetically modified foods labeled in Israel. Mm -hmm. At 5 o'clock the Greenpeace dude comes out and goes, they voted for it, all the GMOs have to be labeled in Israel. And we're like, yeah, hey, way to go. And then we uh, started planting trees on the West Bank, uh, on the path of where the uh, olive trees, in the path of where the wall was supposed to go. We fed mm -hmm. like all, there's a lot of Russian immigrants living on the streets. But they get brought there and they don't know Hebrew and they can't get jobs, so we're feeding them. We fed people at the checkpoints. That was just amazing. Then I came back to the United States and almost immediately I get a call from this woman, Cindy Sheehan. And she says, oh, I'm like in front of George Bush's summer home here. I want to know why, for what noble cause, my son Casey was killed in Iraq. And, and all I've got is candy bars, but Veterans for Peace says maybe you could bring some food. So they said, well, I'll call up Dallas Food Up Bombs and see if they can rush over there. And they're going, oh, we can't help, you, help them. We're being arrested every uh, Sunday ourselves here in Dallas for serving food. So I tried Houston. They said, well, we'll go there for a couple of days, but we need backup. We have to get back to our regular schedule. So I have this big school bus, and we well, filled it full of food, got a bunch of volunteers, rushed to Camp Casey to Crawford, Texas, and we set up a kitchen for the whole rest of August. And while feeding Camp Casey, we got to find out there's a hurricane coming towards uh, New Orleans. So one day it's called, uh, they name it, uh, uh, Katrina. So we make a web page called foodnotbombs.net Katrina. We email all the Food Not Bombs people and listeners we know. Let's go help with the rescue <coughs> effort. A couple of days, two days, three days after Katrina passes, I get a call from Dan from Hartford Food Not Bombs. He goes, oh my god, there's a military checkpoint down here south of Baton Rouge. They say we need a letter of permission. Oh, don't worry, Dan, I'll make you a letter of permission. So I make some letterhead, I write a little letter to give them permission to go to, down to help, and I sign it, and I email him a PDF. He puts it in the window of the bus, and he goes down the next day, and the military's, oh, that's great, you got your letter of permission, way to go. <laughs> then we start getting calls like crazy. Hi, the Red Cross gave us this number for food. Where's the food? And we're like, what town are you in? Oh, we'll figure it out. And pretty soon we have like kitchens in 20 cities of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And uh, we're feeding FEMA, we're feeding all these people. The Red Cross are referring everybody to us because they had a rule that they weren't allowed to go down into the area. So for eight months, we provide vegan meals to the survivors of, of Katrina throughout all of the South. And then shortly after that, I get an email that November from St. Petersburg, Russia. Turns out neo-Nazis have attacked the Food Not Bombs meal one Sunday outside the main downtown bookstore, injuring two of the volunteers and killing one of them, Tamur. So now Food Not Bombs in the Russian world is organizing like crazy. Um, in the, uh, so far, and hopefully this will be the end of it, but four Food Not Bombs kids have been killed while serving food by Nazis and neo-Nazis in Russia. A couple of months later, um, they set off a time bomb at the St. Petersburg meal, but we were about 10 minutes late, so no one got hurt. But this inspired Funa Bombs to just take off throughout the uh, Russian language world. And they had the, our next world gathering, which ended up being held in uh, 2007 on the Ukrainian Russian border. It was like immense. And then we, we um, uh, around, uh, wasn't uh, before that, uh, there was a. Um, Christchurch, New Zealand, Food Not Bombs have started this thing called the Really, Really Free Markets, and that started going all over the world. I've got an article about the Jakarta one, mm -hmm. often done on Buy Nothing Day. Um, mm -hmm. People in Eugene started a thing called Food Not Lawns, mm -hmm. and that started taking off, where mm -hmm. collectives do that. Now, of course, you've got the Bikes Not Bombs, and you've got the Home Not Trails, and so 
like a full service uh, revolution. Um, <laughs> at, at one point, New Zealand Funa, or, uh, Reykjavik Funa bombs this, got the table and their food, and the people are going, we're not poor here, why are you bothering with this thing? And they're, oh, well, we were trying to change society. And sure enough, the U.S. housing industry collapsed, and their leaders had invested in our housing industry, so their economy collapsed. So people were reading the flyers and racking it going, that's terrible what these bankers did, man, we should go protest them. And they're all reading our flyers and stuff. And eventually, after a few weeks, they go, we should march on the parliament building. So the Funa Bombs <coughs> meal becomes a, a weekly march to the parliament building. And eventually, they overthrow the government. Um, so now, um, that, then around that same time, they also made a large group feeding law in Orlando, Florida, that you could only feed 24 people uh, twice a year per uh, parks, and, uh, and, uh, and you had to get a permit to do it. And we won the first couple. We had one arrest in, in 2006, and he won his jury trial, and we had a great order by the federal court saying that, it, this, that food sharing was a, right, a First Amendment right of free expression. Mm. But just before... The city was supposed to pay our attorneys $200,000. They appealed it in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta. And on uh, April 12th, we lost that appeal, and saying that our constitutional rights were protected because we're allowed to serve twice a year. So uh, that was more than enough exp free expression um, <laughs> for park. But that meant you had to move every week to a different park because we serve twice a week in, in Orlando. So in, in uh, June, we, uh, we, we had a big gathering in Orlando. We decided we would resist it. They started arresting us in June. They made 24 arrests. Um, it was just before that, we started also organizing to provide food at the Occupation and Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. I ended up getting arrested a second time and did 17 days. And when I got out, my inbox was full of emails from Adbusters saying they, wanted to, uh, uh, they were going to do uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, on the 17th of September, so we started organizing for that too. And then uh, when Wall Street happened, Funat Bomb's kids joined others to set up the kitchen there at Zakati Park and started bringing food down there. Before long, Funat Bomb's activists all over the world were providing, helping provide food at 99% cafes and so on and occupations all around the world. And I had the good fortune to stay sleep at 15 of them in, uh, in uh, <coughs> eastern United States. I slept and stayed uh, or in uh, late September, or shortly after the 17th of <coughs> September at Wall Street <coughs> itself. And then I helped set up a ki two kitchens in DC, and I went, ended up doing uh, Food Not Bombs at Occupy Boston, which coincidentally is exactly the same place where the March 26, 1981, first meal was served to protest the, oh, the Bank of Boston and the economic policies that could lead to a future where people have to stand in line to eat at soup kitchens. And so uh, the first day I was there, I, some people come up, they see this literature table and the banner, and they go, oh, we do food not bombs in our town. And I'm like, oh, what town is that? And they go, oh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Oh, wow. So now, you know, food not bombs is in over a thousand cities of the world. Um, we were mm -hmm. doing like the London and Budapest and all these occupations, Melbourne, it was like amazing. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, you had that experience here with how incredible the occupation uh, has been so far. And, and uh, there's a big move to try to get back out and public, reclaim public space again all over the country. So there's a general strike on May 1st that's being called for. And actually a ton of unions are backing that, which is really uh, impressive. There's uh, this 99% spring where there's been nonviolent trainings all over the country, and there's going to be more of them starting on, uh, I think, April 9th. And so um, it's, uh, and one thing you need at an occupation is food, and a food not bombs thing is a really good thing to have if you're going to have an occupation. And so this could be really great that all the way through the whole summer we have these camps again and, and are doing this, like, uh, amazing uh, global uprising to finally get more of a post-capitalist uh, society where every, no one is standing in line to eat at soup kitchens. They're just going to stand in line to eat at parties instead, and uh, everybody has a place where they, they can live. And uh, this, in preparation of all this, however, the government had an idea that they were going to ban outdoor food uh, in the United States. So Jan early January, I started getting emails from people saying they were told that if they were caught feeding the hungry in their town, they could do 
uh, uh, six months in jail, a year in jail, pay a $2,000 fine. Houston proposed that they ban uh, outdoor food service, uh, the fine being $2,000 and, and a half a year in jail. Philadelphia just did ban outdoor food service. And so uh, New York City is proposing the ban of outdoor food service. So all across America in the last three months, there's been dozens of cities that are advocating that it be illegal to share free food outside to the hungry. And I uh, have a fly, a lot of times they'll be a, build a coalition of churches and so on to, uh, to uh, write um, op-ed pieces saying how bad it is to feed the poor outside. So, and then those churches often will, uh, re, uh, will eventually say, oh no, we were mistaken, we should not have signed that letter. But, um, so it's an interesting struggle. So on April 1st, there is a global day of action. Uh, in support of the right to share free food. And yesterday I got an email from Minced Food Not Bombs. It turns out in Belarus they not only have been arresting us for sharing food, and, which is a dictatorship, um, every couple of, uh, every week they've been arresting our volunteers there, but they raided a benefit concert in Minsk on Saturday, arrested 100 people, and charged the 15 Food Not Bombs core, the core members of Food Not Bombs with hooliganism, and they're facing heavy uh, jail sentence. A lot of Russian food bomb kids have recently been arrested, including some in a, a town outside of Moscow, and they're being charged with what's called intifa rash. So if the neo-Nazis attack you, then you can be charged and spend years in prison for being the victim of assault of a of neo-Nazi attack. So that's a little bit of what's happening with food bombs. And then we have a video about food bombs in, in Nigeria that we can show. And then I'd be, love to take questions and get comments and and all that, so cool, so thanks.